Hey, Cypher here. It's been a long time since I did an episode on California history. This is episode 8, but it's been like a year. And part of that is because I finally hit my knowledge barrier. Basically, I've done research on everything that I talked about in this series before, but now I'm having to conduct new research. So that's why it took so long. Seriously, if you look at the last seven episodes in the description, you might find a bit of an Easter egg in there, but I can't put that Easter egg in here this time. If you haven't seen the series thus far, here's the playlist. You should probably go watch it, but this can be watched in isolation. After the Central Pacific Railroad connected with the Union Pacific in 1869, California was finally connected by rail to the east. Prior to the Civil War, the only way to get to the Golden State was by overland trails or ship. With a transcontinental railroad, people could travel far more cheaply. But the first transcontinental was dangerously limited. Passing through the treacherous Intermountain West, the trains would be held up because of inclement weather. Further building needed to be achieved if California was going to export her riches eastward. The US government made special provisions for railroad builders. They gave land to these railroads, and in California, that was extremely valuable. A new railroad monopoly soon eclipsed the Central Pacific. Before the Civil War, an extremely partisan survey was conducted to find the best route for the first transcontinental railroad. It concluded the southern route was best. Unfortunately, the person who approved that conclusion was none other than the Secretary of War, Jefferson Davis, who went on to become the President of the Confederacy. Oops. During the war, the fighting in New Mexico meant that the railroad had to take the central route. But the war was over now, and the next transcontinental wanted to take advantage of the better weather to the south. So the Southern Pacific was created in 1865. It originally only had the modest goal of connecting Northern and Southern California, going through the difficult mountain passes of the Coastal and Tehachapi Ranges. Southern California wouldn't be connected until the mid-1870s, just in time for the Southern Pacific to cross into Arizona Territory. As more and more lines were completed, a rash of train robberies took place in the late 19th century, which would only be stopped in the early 20th century. It took until 1883 for the southern route to be completed, yet other routes were beginning to be completed as well. Dozens of railroads sprung up in the 1880s, who initially competed with the Southern Pacific, but they were all doomed. This was before anti-monopoly laws, and the Southern Pacific was one of the primary targets of those laws when they came about. The Southern Pacific gobbled up every competing railroad they could and used funds from the lands the government gave them to get more capital. The big four tycoons who funded the original Central Pacific bought the Southern in 1868 and then used the influx of cash to buy the Central back in 1870. So the two longest railroads in the US were owned by Californians under one company. So of course no one could compete. They were backed by government subsidies and they were able to buy off corrupt officials to expand their power even more. Soon, the Southern Pacific owned a good chunk of the Northern routes into California too. Through all of this, they owned a large proportion of Californian land, and everyone simply had to deal with them. They even built down the west coast of Mexico, controlling much of that territory as well. Even when the Santa Fe Railroad competed with the Southern Pacific elsewhere, they still had to terminate in Needles, California sending passengers to the coast via the Southern Pacific. Literally, their biggest competition had to pay them to use their lines. The Southern Pacific was a monopoly like no other in the West, and its basis was to serve California. The problem was people needed to know about the West. Folks had been advertising California for decades. The immensely popular Two Years Before the Mast talked about Alta California in 1840, before the gold rush even happened. 
but boosters went into overdrive once California was American. Still, once the gold ran its course, the state seemed like just another agricultural community. So why would anybody want to travel to the Golden State if it wasn't for gold? Boosters used a number of methods to inspire travel along the Southern Pacific. They buoyed the popularity of Western fiction, spoke of the wondrous landscape, but most importantly, they transformed that landscape. Ever wonder why there's palm trees everywhere in California? There are naturally occurring species of palm trees in California, but you'll notice in pictures before the railroads, nobody was bothering to plant palm trees all over the place. The railroads wanted to advertise the Mediterranean climate of California, so they started planting palm trees and it caught on. So when you see rows of palm trees in California, realize that's a railroad advertisement. Because New Mexico and Arizona were on the way to California, the railroads reinvented those states too. New Mexico became the land of enchantment, which is still the state's motto. All this railroad stuff kicked off a boom in revival architecture that harkened back to the Spanish days of the Southwest. New Mexico got Pueblo Revival, and California got Mission Revival. Arizona and Nevada basically just got their styles from California. The popular image of the Southwest, from the Pacific to Texas, was an invention of the railroads for the sake of advertising travel to California. As the last gold rush of the contiguous United States ended in Bodie, California around 1890, railroads also needed a new reason for expansion in California. They'd already linked north and south, east and west. So anything that happened helped the Southern Pacific. They just needed something to happen. Luckily, a new mining industry blossomed around the turn of the century. For a long time, the main source of oil was the whaling industry. But they had hunted those whales to near extinction, and the whole industry was basically not profitable anymore. Crude oil took its place. California had vast reserves of it, and quickly overtook the country in production. The Golden State was the main producer of black gold by 1920. It started simply enough in the 1870s with Pico Canyon. Soon people were finding oil all over California, sometimes even offshore, like at Santa Barbara. Infrastructure was quickly built for transporting this stuff, so it was like a whole new gold rush. My native county of San Luis Obispo has a city in it called Pismo Beach, which was the Chumash name for tar, as in oil. San Luis Obispo had its second pier created for the rush, and still has the remnants of the old tank farm that blew up in 1926. The state itself exploded with production, but one region became the hotspot. SoCal was behind NorCal population and infrastructure-wise until the 20th century. Los Angeles had actually been drilling for oil since 1857, but it was the 1892 well that set off a boom. It was so big that the LA Stock Exchange was created in 1899. People got rich quick, and many, like the affable C.C. Julian, simply kept getting away with swindle after swindle. People were trying to get rich quick off of this stuff and all kinds of underhanded business practices were done to make a quick buck. SoCal was built on crude oil. Even more disastrous than the con artists were the environmental effects. Several of the largest oil spills in history happened in California. The Lakeview Gusher in 1910 made a lake of crude for over a year. Oil tanks were constantly exploding and minor leaks often were just left alone. The oil boom in California eventually came to an end during the Great Depression, but the oil industry is still a major presence in California, along with its incumbent spills. The worst oil spill up to the time was the Santa Barbara spill in 1969, which has only recently been beaten by the Deepwater Horizon. I was on the Central Coast when another oil spill happened there in 2015, which shut down the Pacific Coast Highway for a few days. So the problem of the oil industry persists, but nowadays, they're not a major factor in California's economy. There's only one pump in the Los Angeles oil field that is still operated today. Instead, another industry came to dominate California and eventually the world. Founded in Los Angeles, Hollywood burst onto the stage while oil was still the mainstay of the region. Now, the culture industry is. But that'll have to wait for the next one. Hopefully it won't take a year for me to finish putting together a history of Hollywood. It's been a long time coming.
So be sure to subscribe to see that, and I'll see you next time.